be with my ethernet. So tonight should be the last night is what I'm saying of wireless connection and uh, yeah. Anyways, so let's begin. Uh, so I believe we left off kind of discussing Darwin's view of descent with modification, right? That the, uh, his, his theory was based on this principle of a common ancestry amongst all organisms. And, <clears throat> and as millions of years passed and lots of reproduction in those times, mutations accumulated, differences in it, organisms accumulated, and he termed it uh, descent with modification, that we have this common ancestry, but the, the, common, uh, the common structures, common characteristics amongst all life were modified over time as they adapted to these different environments. And we're gonna see where we left off with homologous structures, um, kind of some very, very interesting uh, evidence that supports that idea. Um, so let's, let's take a look at that. Okay, so I believe this is where we left off on Monday. Um, okay, so let me get my, where was it? Ooh, where did I put it? I'm always losing things. Okay. So go ahead and uh, define it again for you guys. So this is, this is our second. So as, as we looked at last time, uh, we looked at fossils, right? The evidence that supports evolution, evolutionary theory by common descent. Uh, there's really three key pieces of evidence. The fossil record, which we talked about last time. And uh, the second piece of evidence is anatomical evidence, okay? So that's what we're gonna explore starting today. Um, so anatomical evidence. One thing here. So I'm actually, my dad for is so bored. I, he wanted to watch me lecture. So I'm sending him the invite link. <laughs> Forgot to do that before we started. So I'm just, if he, uh, if he decides to show up, Dr. LaRue himself. Um, Just let him know. Sent link to. Okay. Hey, we'll see what happens. See if he comes. All right. Does he specialize in biology? Yeah, <laughs> he's way more knowledgeable than I am. He's an urgent care doctor. He's brilliant. And I talk to him a lot about these things and he's super into it. Um, he's got, uh, just, just so much wisdom and expertise when it comes to science, biology, and medicine. Um, so it's always fun to, uh, you know, bounce ideas off of him and learn from him too. Mission Hospital. So he's down here in San Diego. So he works at, um, uh, he works at an urgent care in where I live in Pacific Beach, uh, down here in San Diego. We're quite a ways from Orange County. Uh, I was, oh man, the commute was dreadful when I was on campus, um, but I like driving. I do, I don't know why. It's just, I don't know, I do. It's fun to me. So I didn't mind it. Although it was late at night, as you know, 5.30 and then we'd end at 10 because we would do labs. 
and then I would, wouldn't get home till really late. But anyway, um, so back to this. It's anim anatomical evidence is sort of the second um, category of evidence that is uh, supporting evolution and supporting this idea that uh, there's a common ancestry amongst organisms. And as they went to new locations uh, in, on the planet, as they were exposed to new environments, they started to look different. There was this modification, this adaptation to the environment. So let's start by talking about homologous structures. Um, that's the first piece of anatomical evidence, homologous structures. And then we'll come back to this in a moment, but let's define it. So homologous structures, it's one of my favorite pieces of evidence because it's, it's so neat to see so clearly um, this, this commonality amongst life, but also these differences. Um, so homologous structures are structures with the same basic anatomy. but not necessarily the same function. Um, and then I'll add amongst uh, organisms based on common ancestry. Okay, so as I defined uh, descent with modification last time, kind of just go quickly back to that definition way back here. Here we go. So shared ancestry, this results in shared characteristics amongst organisms that are modified over time, right? Um, so we, we talked about this last time. And of course, it's they're modified and then acted on by the different environments on Earth that these organisms were exposed to. Obviously, as we can see with these homologous structures, a bat, a human, a horse, porpoise, they live in very different environments, right? Porpoise swims, horses, you know, gallop, <laughs> humans, we, you know. We build things, we climb, bats fly. So there's all kinds of uses. Um, but I want you to notice the really interesting thing here is that uh, the bone uh, segments here are all uh, similar. They're, they, are, they all were modified from a common ancestor. This common ancestor had these pieces just arranged the same way, these three main large pieces, and then over time, over generations, as these, as the progeny and offspring um, over millions of years were exposed to different environments, uh, the um, mutations, right, that accumulated, that changed these common structures into a wing, into a, uh, 
horse's leg or a fin uh, were, so, were preferred. They were preferred in these different environments. Now, this is sort of a callback as well to our whole environment dictates phenotype theme here in evolution that depending on where these organisms lived, um, that environment selects for individuals with those advantageous traits that allow them to be faster and catch food faster or evade predators, blend into their environments, uh, be resistant to diseases, that kind of stuff. Um, and of course, those four organisms are very different environments, but it's this idea that they have that common bone structure that was just modified over time. There aren't like brand new bones assembled out of nowhere to make that fin. It was just this modification that Darwin, in editing of something that already existed. That's the key. Um, and that's that common ancestry thing. So we have these shared uh, appendage bones and other many other things with all life on the planet. Um, as we'll see soon, we actually have shared genes with organisms as different from us as spiders, bacteria. We have a gene for a tail, creating a tail. <laughs> we don't use it. Although there is actually a a condition very rare where it's reactivated and humans are born with a very small tail. I'm not making that up. It's pretty, pretty crazy. Um, okay, did I say everything I wanted to say? Um, okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, vestigial tails. So perfect segue. We're going to be talking about Oh, you knew someone with one? That's cool. Um, I would like to have a tail. I think that would be cool. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's talk about vestigial structures. Oh, one of my favorites is depicted here in our uh, whale. Uh, but let's talk about, this is our second piece of anatomical uh, evidence. Vestigial, vestigial structures. Oops. Vestigial structures. These are anatomical structures that are present in living organisms today. That don't don't perform the same function as they once did in their shared ancestors. Sorry if I kind of stood in the way. Um, So a couple, so essentially a vestigial structure uh, or organ is something that we have, but we don't need or use, but other organisms use them and our past ancestor used it, but it just remained there even though we don't need it anymore. 
but we didn't have to get rid of it because there doesn't really harm you to have it. Um, humans, we have a tailbone, uh, appendix, absolutely. So that's why some people, when they get their appendix removed, it's they'll still live, it's still good, fine. I believe the appendix was um, more useful in because we were not as, I think this is what it is. Um, we weren't as meat eaters. We, we were more, we had an ancestor that was more, um, you know, it, it would digest purely uh, plant material. So the appendix would function in digesting plant material. But since we evolved to eat, you know, not burgers, but meat, <laughs> meat per se, you know, animals and um, protein from other sources, then the appendix just stopped functioning. We didn't really need it. Um, so that, that's a great, another great example. Um, one of my favorites though is actually the whale here. So whales have a pelvic bone. They have this pelvic bone, but whales don't need a pelvic bone because they don't have limbs. Pelvic bones are to articulate hind limbs. And what's amazing, and I think I have a slide on it. Usually if I have time, I talk a little bit about, yeah, I do. So whales are a fascinating story because who, who, who here knew that whales were mammals? Yes, ma whales are mammals. So meaning they, uh, first of all, they breathe oxygen in the air. They don't have gills. So they have to surface, right? They have hair, absolutely. Um, they are warm blooded. They have eyelashes. Yeah, they have, they have hair for sure. They, they also have some beard hair, I think. Well, I love whales, they're awesome. Um, so they're, they uh, are warm blooded. They give live birth. They don't like lay eggs or anything like reptiles. Um, they breastfeed. Yes, absolutely. Um, so they're mammals. They have all the qualifications, meaning, so mammals came along later evolutionarily. We're probably one of the last groups of animals to come about um, maybe 70 million years ago, something like that. I'm pretty bad with dates, but um, <laughs> that's why I don't teach history. But so uh, essentially, uh whales have or used to their ancestor lived on land they had an uh, ancestor lived on land and over millions of years uh and it wasn't just whales uh dolphins and uh let me think manatees porpoises are all mammals and they transitioned to the sea so check this out and that's why that pelvic bone's there. So this is the timeline of whale evolution. Um, and as you can see, pretty amazing. Oh, so yeah, so here are the time scale in millions of years. Uh, but so these notches, we're gonna talk about these evolutionary trees today, by the way um once we finish evolution but um or finish the evidence at least for evolution uh but these notches represent a common ancestor okay and uh so you can actually see here that hippopotamuses share a pretty recent common ancestor with living cetaceans or whales um so there, if you had to choose a list, so these guys are extinct, you can see by the end of these branches here, these three. Uh, but hippopotamuses and even like reindeer, um, they share common ancestors with whales um, because whales, the common ancestor was a land mammal. And so over millions of years, and I think there are a good amount of hypotheses, but nothing has been shown definitively that whales transition to sea, but nobody really knows why. It might be because there was a food source or more food available there. 
there was um, less predators. They just had a better chance of survival there. Um, so that's, you know, and over time, of course, they lost their hind limbs so they could swim better. The ones that could swim better could evade predators, obtain food, etc. So it's pretty amazing. I never knew that for teaching biology, actually. Um, so I like to talk about whale evolution. Okay, this is also another fun one. So still under the category of anatomical evidence. Um, Ooh, don't want to show you the answers yet. Okay, so comparative embryology. Um, let me see. Okay, so what I have pictured here are five different embryos um, for five different vertebrate animals. And one of them is a cat, one of them is a chicken, one of them is a human, one of them is a possum, and one of them is a bat. So just really quickly, I'll repeat them. I just want you to write down the letter and then the animal that you think it is, just by looking at their embryos. So I'll say it again. And if you have the slides in front of you, don't cheat. <laughs> um, you know, it's kind of fun because they look so similar, but I want you to try and guess. So there's a cat, possum, bat, chicken, and human. And then I'll tell you the answer soon. It's L, oh no. <laughs> yeah, I usually, you know, on campus, it's uh, basically, you know, only a few students print out the slides. Plus it's an animation. So, you know. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is, I want you guys to type in and I'm gonna go one at a time. So A, what do you think A is? Okay, we got cat for A. Okay, what about B? I'm gonna write it down with you. So we're voting cat for A, possum for B, okay. How about C? Bat for C, okay. A shrimp. <laughs> it does look like a shrimp. Oh, we have possum for C as well, okay. How about D? Dinosaur, yeah, seriously. Kind of, I kind of looks like a octopus sort of tentacle. Um, chicken, okay, let's put chicken. <laughs> I know they all look really similar. And I also saw humans. So what about E? What do you think E is? Human, human.
So you guys look ahead. Just kidding. D was human. Okay, let's take a look at the answers. And then I want you guys to like compare and see how many you got. Boom. So E was human. <laughs> Those are the embryos. <laughs> I guess they did. Yeah, crazy, right? Um, so this is kind of just, I guess, emphasizing the point that there are many developmental genes that are shared amongst vertebrates um, because of their an common ancestry. They're all very closely related to one another. Um, and just the fact of, well, um, an interesting fact that all vertebrate embryos actually develop uh, gill slits. So I'll write this down. It's just kind of a fun, interesting fact as part of this anatomical evidence. So all vertebrate embryos develop gill slits. and a, a tail, a postanal tail, during development. In the early weeks, at least, of fetal development. So I'll add early weeks, early weeks of fetal development. Of course, uh, terrestrial vertebrate animals uh, don't have gills, right? Because we're on land. Um, they actually become part of the ears and throat. Um, Oh, do I see questions? <laughs> Cursed. <laughs> yeah. Um, definition of comparative embryology is kind of fancy, but essentially there's really no definition. All it really means is we're comparing embryos. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't really have a definition. Um, that's, yeah, we're just looking at the embryos, that's all. Yeah, no, no, you didn't miss anything. Um, so all vertebrate embryos develop gill slits and postanal tail as well, as part of this shared genes and development, um, which is super interesting, just as, a, you know, sort of a, a relic of our past, um, sort of a vestigial thing. But because we obviously don't use gills anymore, all life comes from the oceans um, millions and millions of years ago. So we used to need gills, but they become part of the ears and throat for our terrestrial mammals um, or vertebrate animals, at least. Um, and then uh, the tail as well, um, unless you have that gene mutation, it goes away during development. Um, Okay. Cool. Let me see what time it is, 6.04. Okay, let's talk about the last piece of evidence. Shared DNA, uh, the molecular aspect of evidence. Oh, I 
guess, oh, in my notes, I didn't update my notes. Let me see. is annoying. I guess I don't have any. Okay, that's fine. Um, oh, maybe that was it. Okay, sweet. So it's all on the slides. That's nice. Don't have to write. <laughs> okay, um, so let's go back to that then. So as you can see from this picture, there are many stretches of our genome the collection of our entirety of our DNA and our nuclei of the cells uh, that have these exact same conserved, as we call them, regions between its things as different as mice, gorilla, human, hamster, chimpanzee. Um, so there's tons of stretches of similarities. Um, and I don't know why these letters are different than DNA. I might have to find a new picture, actually. I'm just noticing they're not even like A, T, C, and G. It's like a V, what the heck? Is it amino acids? Can't, what? That's very strange. So I gotta fix that. But pretend they're A, T, C, and G. <laughs> um, anyway, I haven't given this lecture in a while. I usually, um, I, you know, I do other things, but uh, I like it. So I tried it again. Let me do to fix slide. Okay. But I did update these two bullet points here. So first of all, the universal genetic code is a good um, indicator of this uh, commonality amongst life that all cells, all organisms, you know, unicellular to multicellular life is going to utilize the same genetic code. Um, and this is really uh, powerful evidence that um, essentially from the very first life form to all life after it uh, inherited that same genetic code. Uh, and then, of course, what I was saying here was shared DNA. Uh, there are shared genes between uh, organisms dissimilar as humans and bacteria. This is evident in um, a lot of the me metabolic pathways that we've looked at, um, like glycolysis, for instance. All the enzymes in glycolysis, all life on the planet performs glycolysis in their cells. And so the genes that encode for these enzymes are the same uh, in all life forms. So it's pretty amazing. But those are the main points that I wanted to know. Um, give you a minute to write it down if you're writing it down. Oh, I guess my dad's not coming. Oh, well. I'll send him the recording. <laughs> okay. Video. Do we have time for the video? I think we might. We do. Kind of a neat video. Six ten. I know I want to do hierarchy today. So classification of organisms. So let me just. We might have to save it for the end if we have time. But let's take a look. Let me see.
Yeah, I think we have time. Cool. Let's take a look. Um, you guys are probably pretty sick of videos by now, though. I imagine this one's short. I do short videos during lecture. Um, okay. Oh, was the, oh, so you like the video for the lab? That's awesome. Cool. <laughs> okay. Dude, it does this every time. Can you just share, please? Let me try it again. Okay, let's take a look. In the last few decades, we've seen a completely new kind of evidence emerge that demonstrates unequivocally the close relationship between humans and chimps. And that evidence... Why isn't it moving? Dude. In the last... You know, ever since I updated my computer, things have been screwing up. It's super annoying. I should not have updated. Of any two oh, days. now it's changing? We've got DNA chimps. Okay, I'll try it one more time. I don't know. Was it? It wasn't changing for you guys. I'm assuming. So let me try it one more time. Gosh, this is so annoying. Okay, please work. In the last few decades, we've seen a completely yes. new kind of evidence emerge that <laughs> demonstrates unequivocally the close relationship between humans and chips. And that evidence has come from DNA. This is DNA. We've got DNA, chimps have got DNA, bacteria have got DNA, petunias have got DNA, crabs have got DNA. Every living animal, plant, fish, frog has got DNA. And if we compare the DNAs of any two species, we can establish how closely related they are one to another. It's of the four chemical building blocks of DNA determines the traits of all living things. These are represented by A's, T's, C's, and G's. Each generation passes on this chemical text to its offspring. Occasional mistakes in copying, mutations, can result in new traits. Page takes part of a gene in humans and aligns it with the corresponding sequence of the same gene found in chimps to compare the letters. And what we see is that these two sequences, the human and chimp sequences, are spectacularly similar. They are, in fact, 98% identical. There's just a couple of spelling changes. Why are there only a couple of spelling changes? Because uh, we and chimps had a common ancestor only a few million years ago. If more time had passed since we had our last common ancestor, more spelling changes would have accumulated. To make that point, Page shows the same gene sequence of a mammal that is very different from humans, the rat. You see that there are far more differences, let's say between the human and the rat, than between the human and the chimp. That's because our common ancestor with the rat lived about 80 or 100 million years ago, and there's been much more time for spelling differences to accumulate. We've learned that in, in primates, DNA sequences are changing at a rate of about 1% every 3 million years. In other words, about 5 million years ago, the precursor of humans and chimps lived. And we can see that. We can, in a sense, read that right out of the DNA sequences. In the 19th century, in Darwin's time, it was audacious to claim that humans and chimps were closely related. There wasn't that much scientific evidence. But in the 20th century, we've seen the fossil record emerge. <laughs> In the 21st century, 
The combination of fossil record, physical features, and molecular evidence leaves no doubt that humans and apes shared a common ancestor several million years ago. And humans and apes, like those early primates, have continued to evolve ever since. Yay. Cool. <laughs> all right. Shared DNA. I think that's it. That's all I wanted to talk about anyway. I think there's one more slide, but um, yeah, I don't need to go into it. Oops. We'll get to the cute animal in a moment. Um, OK, one last misconception. Yay. Oh. What is incorrect about this statement? You would not find any shared DNA between humans and spiders because the DNA of a species is its own. Basically, I'll just go ahead and answer it because it might require a long explanation, but um, because all life descended from common ancestors, there's going to be shared DNA um, amongst all of us. It's just over time, these mutations, as the video pointed out, accumulate depending on how far uh, or how long ago that common ancestor is with the other organism you're comparing it to, kind of like the, the chimpanzee and us. Our common ancestor was 5 million years ago. So there's only a few differences, funny enough. So that's what I meant by evolution takes a long time. It's 5 million years, but and we still have 98% DNA similarity with chimps. And then our common ancestor with mice was around 70 million years ago. We still have a lot of DNA in common with mice. Um, that's why a lot of lab research, actually most lab research is done with mice, um, because we have common DNA, common cellular uh, enzyme systems and things that when you test it and you, you mice get the same diseases as us, it often uh, can give us insight for humans um, and how it would affect humans with certain drugs and whatnot. Oh, I don't have the correct thing. I really got to fix these slides. Um, uh, okay. Well, that's it. I don't, I, we don't have to talk about this. Um, if you're interested, just reach out. Okay, so moving on. So today we're gonna move on and talk about um, how we classify organisms because the remainder of this unit, we're actually going to talk specifically about every life. <laughs> well, life on the grander sense, like this unit is really devoted to uh, organismal biology. And I kind of maybe mentioned at the very beginning of the semester that we start very zoomed in with chemistry. We are looking at molecules. And then we kind of, we zoom out as we go, as the semester progresses, we zoom out. We go from the molecular to, and the atomic to the cellular, uh, talking about DNA and these biological molecules to um, cells themselves dividing enzymes and pathways in metabolism, things like that. So we keep zooming out. And now we're beyond the cell. Now we're talking about evolution and talking about um, characteristics of organisms and the relationship between organisms. Um, so we're kind of at a new branch of biology. It's part of why I love intro. We kind of get to, you know, skim the surface of all these different things. Um, and okay, so let's begin. Classification of organisms, like this guy. Oh, 
<laughs> okay. So the first thing we're going to talk about is how we construct a phylogenetic tree, a uh, evolutionary tree, as we saw with the whales, similar to that. So let's define a phylogenetic tree. As, well, it's a diagram, right? That's going to represent evolutionary relationships among groups of organisms. So phylogenetic trees represent evolutionary relationships among, among groups of organisms. And these trees are constructed based on, based on shared characteristics. And we'll look at examples of this. But as we saw in the video, I'm glad I played it. It's pretty, pretty good video. Um, but also DNA evidence. And you can actually track how many years apart the common ancestor of two organisms was based on how similar or different their DNA is. Um, so based on shared characteristics and DNA similarities. So this is something that evolutionary biologists are doing all the time. Similarities. Okay, so let's do kind of a representative template of sorts to show how we make these trees, what they look like, and then we'll look at an example. Okay. So we'll start with the root. This is the oldest ancestor. Okay. And it'll look something like this. So this is going to be group A, group B, group C, and group D. OK. Um, and then on the left side here, it's going to represent time up till the present.
All right. So the way this kind of works, I can move this up a little too, works is it's kind of like descent. It is this descent with modification. And so as there is this descent, new organisms coming into existence, changes are accumulating, mutations, right, that give rise to these new traits. And so there's going to be this, of course, this um, shared characteristic aspect, this commonality amongst all these organisms. But over time, there's going to be new char uh, characteristics that come about um, in, the, in the ancestors of these organisms. And so we do these little notches here. And so this notch will represent a trait that is shared by all the organisms represented this way, above the trait. So A, B, C, and D. Then over time, say millions of years, mutations in DNA led to new traits um, as species evolved uh, and a new trait comes about, okay? And all of a sudden group A doesn't have that trait. Um, it's, it's either um, it lives in a different area or it didn't need this trait. So the trait that would list here would only be shared by groups upward this way, right? Because A is beneath it. So this trait would be shared by B, C, and D, groups B, C, and D. And then I'll draw one more notch here. So what groups would this trait be shared by? here. Yeah, C and D, exactly. This new trait came about and groups that evolved thus thereafter had this trait because that gene was passed on, right? Uh, but B was not part of that group. So let's take a look at an example of one of these trees with this sort of uh, pattern of how we arrange them. Okay. So this is evolutionary phylogenetic tree. Uh, it's actually detailing out vertebrate evolution uh, following invertebrate evolution. So invertebrates are kind of like, um, and we're talking about animals too, by the way, uh, vertebrate animals versus invertebrate animals. Invertebrate animals would include jellyfish, sponges, uh, corals, sea anemones, um, uh, insects have an exoskeleton, they're invertebrate, crabs, lobsters as well, mollusks. So uh, these are the vertebrate, some of the vertebrate uh, organisms, animals more specifically, and how they came about. So they all have vertebrae, right? Everyone down. 
And then all of a sudden this bony skeleton emerged. And so this ancestor, okay. These, these junctions here represent the common ancestor, had a bony skeleton, but sharks um, were already existent and they didn't develop that bony skeleton. Um, and so they kind of diverge off, right? But everything down has it. Four limbs, fish, of course, stayed fish. <laughs> um, and as this transition to land occurred, um, interestingly enough, fish actually started to develop limbs. Uh, they found success on land. There was a mutation uh, that there were these, um, uh, you know, of course this happened over hundreds of millions of years, but these fish called lung fish um, developed not just lungs to breathe, uh, to get oxygen from the air, but um, limbs to move on land. And the very first group of organisms that transitioned from sea to land were amphibians. Then amniotic egg came about. And there, were, there was this mutation where a common ancestor uh, uh, would give uh, or would lay eggs um, that were so-called amniotic eggs, which are these eggs that are protected usually with a shell. They have nutrients inside. Amphibians don't have that, so on and so forth. So you get the idea. Um, and that's how we construct these trees. Um, it's pretty, pretty good, useful detailing out of how life progressed, how things came into existence, and how all organisms following those traits that came into existence inherited those traits. Um, and it kind of constructs the differences, the major differences among life on the earth. Um, so it's pretty amazing. Um, yeah, that's how we do it. Uh, Red-lipped batfish are interesting. They look like frogs. Really? Sounds interesting. It's a fish that looks like a frog. Cool. Um, yeah, there's a lot of amazing life on the planet. <laughs> there certainly is. Okay, so this is a very important slide. Um, so we're gonna talk about, we're gonna kind of do a similar type of tree and talk about, like I said, this unit is devoted to life on earth, all life, biodiversity and all the different kinds of organisms and their characteristics. Um, and so we have to start at the broadest lens, the very overarching view of all life. And we can classify all life into three different domains, okay? Um, domain eukarya, domain bacteria, and domain archaea. So we're gonna do that now. And so to finish this lecture, we're gonna zoom in. We're gonna kind of discuss from the most, the outermost view of all life and categorize them into three different domains, as we call it. All life will fall under one of these domains. Um, we are part of domain eukarya. And then we're gonna go over, like I said, this lecture, this, is, this part is sort of about classifying organisms, grouping them as we are doing. Um, and we have specific, we have a specific organization system called the hierarchy of classification. And that will be our last sort of topic for tonight. Um, so let's let's take a look at the domains first, kind of the first part of this hierarchy. Okay. And so we're going to do a tree like that, kind of use that as an example. Okay. So. So the root of the tree is actually the origin of cellular life. It's the first life form. We're going that far back. So origin of cellular life on Earth. So the very first cell, this was approximately 3.8 billion years ago. Um, 
and most scientists believe it was a bacterial cell. This is actually going to be a really good segue into what we're going to talk about at the beginning of next class. Kind of, um, and part of this unit that I find really interesting is kind of going through the history of life a bit and the characteristics that emerge uh, in us and other life that makes us unique. Um, but we start with domain bacteria. So I'll branch it off here. So this is, of course, going to contain all the bacterial cells that exist. And we did talk about, I'm like reminding myself now, because it was a while ago, eukaryotes versus prokaryotes when we talked about cells, right? And that's going to uh be relevant uh, when we talk about these different domains so the main difference between them but we have domain bacteria and then domain archaea Domain archaea. And really, I, I don't have a notch here in my notes, but um, archaea are actually, you don't have to know this, they're they're similar to us. They're, they have some more similarities at least than bacteria. Um, and so they're drawn a little closer, as in we have a more recent common ancestor with archaea. But we're still very different from them. This is billions of years ago. Um, but this group is going to be domain eukarya, which is where we fall into. Eukarya. Totally ran out of room, which is annoying. So I'm actually going to... draw that, sorry. I'll redraw, hold on. If you have this in your notes, you should have room on your paper, I hope. <laughs> like I said, I have whiteboards. Um, so I'm gonna just redraw this and do domain archaea again. And then domain eukarya. Okay. And so I have a notch here. And as we've learned about eukaryotes, all the organisms in this domain, eukarya, are composed of one or more eukaryotic cells. So this is the origin of the eukaryotic cell. And this was about 1.5 BYA I used for a billion years ago. The first eukaryotic cell came into existence we're going to talk about this event next class. It's extremely fascinating. And importantly, as domain eukarya is all composed of eukaryotic cells, both uh, domain archaea, okay, I did not pull out, okay, hold on. <laughs> archaea and bacteria, those are both prokaryotic um, cells. And they're all unicellular. There's no multicellular life that's part of those two domains. 
So bacteria and archaea are uh, unicellular prokaryotes. Okay, domain eukarya, as we progress through time, the most ancient eukaryotes are called protists. Those, that's the focus of next lecture, the protists. And then from the protists over time evolved more kingdoms within this domain, plants, animals, which we fall under, right? And fungi. So plants, animals, and fungi actually uh, came from ancient prokaryote, or from protist cells uh, and protist, uh, protist organisms. And protists are the focus of next lecture because not many people have heard of the protists, but amoebas are protists, algae are actually protists, and uh, phytoplankton. And they are these ancient eukaryotic organisms from which plants, animals, and fungi were derived. They all came from these protists over, of course, hundreds of millions of years. But yeah. So the last thing we're gonna talk about to end the lecture is this hierarchy of classification. Um, I already mentioned kingdoms. Kingdoms come after domain. And as we, as we go through these, um, we're getting more specific as far as shared characteristics in the group. Um, so domain is like the most broad, right? Domain eukarya includes a lot of different uh, organisms that are eukaryotes, right? So let's go. Okay, this doesn't have domain on it, but it starts with domain at the top. I'll leave that up for a moment while I erase. Take a look at the words on the left there. See how kingdom comes next. Okay, so we're actually going to uh, We're actually gonna go through this for a wolf and how a wolf is classified. So a wolf falls under domain eukarya, right? I'm not gonna, I could actually, domain eukarya. So that includes, we're really gonna look at the slide here. Um, And I write it on the board as well. But as we get more specific, so a wolf is part of kingdom animalia. It's an animal, right? So no plants here, no fungi or other protists that are eukarya and the domain eukarya. Wolves are in the phylum chordata. Then it be class mammalia, so the mammals. So we lost the alligator, right? It's not a mammal. Order carnivora, so these are the carnivores. So we lost the skunk and the koala, right? Family canidae, so canine. Genus, or maybe canis is canines, my bad. Yeah, um, genus canis and species lupus. 
more specifically, the wolf is Canis lupus. Um, so let's let's rewrite that order. Time is it? Okay, perfect. So it's domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and then species. Marker's starting to die. So this is what we call the hierarchy of classification for organisms. And as we are, as we go down, we're getting more specific, right? More specific. And so a fun analogy or acronym, I guess it's called, to remember the order here, the domain, kingdom, phylum, et cetera, uh, T, K, P, C, O, F, G, S. The fun analogy is uh, deer, king, Philip, fried, out for great soup. <laughs> okay. And then, so the last thing, well, what time is it? Okay. So dear King Philip cried out for great soup. It's a good way to remember the words, the order it goes in. Um, so last thing I wanna say is that every uh, species, every organism has a scientific name and really a common name so a wolf, as we saw, is Canis lupus. Um, <laughs> James, what do you say? Dumb kids playing catch on freeways get squashed. <laughs> uh, that's pretty good. I like that one too. <laughs> um, yeah, I like that. Whatever works for you. <laughs> Don't play catch on the freeways. Just that's not a good idea. <laughs> that's pretty good. Um, so, uh, this, so every organism has a scientific name and then a common name. So the scientific name for a wolf, as we saw is Canis lupus. It's kind of like a first name and last name. It's the genus and then the species. Um, so genus species, this is the scientific name, right? So our the common name is a wolf, right? Uh, but what, so what's the common name for a human? I mean, I'm sorry, what's the scientific name for human? Does anyone know? The common name is human. Yeah, Homo sapiens. So we're part of the genus Homo species sapien. Exactly. Um, so I'll write that too. Actually, this is not capitalized. It's lowercase. Scientists are particular about that. Um, and so the last thing that I'll say about this is it's kind of, it's interesting. It's kind of like a first and last name. Uh, and 
depending on, or it doesn't matter if you're talking to a scientist in Spain, speaking Spanish, German speaking, Germany speaking German, um, you know, wherever you are in the world, um, homo sapien is the same, right? Uh, so it's kind of a universal scientific language in that regard. All right, that's it. Um, the next time we begin the diversity of organisms, we're gonna talk about the different kingdoms of domain eukarya specifically and kind of dissect and talk about the differences among protists, plants, animals, fungi, what makes them unique and super interesting, uh, what kind of uh, characteristics they have. But that's it for tonight. So does anyone have any questions?